Numbers chapter 11. We're continuing in our study there. We have um, roughly gone through uh, half of the chapter, and uh, we we finished up last week at uh, the end of verse 16. We are able to cover that, of course. This whole chapter is about uh, defining faith, and it's about finding examples of faith from the Old Testament, people that lived and, and died under that Old Covenant and, uh, or even under the old uh, the patriarchal age before the covenant came along. In fact, that's where we are at this point. The first half of the chapter is those that lived under the patriarchal time. Of course, the patriarchal time is the period of human history before the uh, the Israelites left the land of Egypt when Moses became the leader and, and taught the people. And so uh, the patriarchal times when you had, you know, obviously uh, Adam and Eve and Cain and Abel, uh, Enoch, Noah, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Joseph, all of them were under that time. And basically the patriarchal age means that God spoke to the patriarchs fathers of the families, and they're the ones that he communicated uh, to and with. And so it was that way up until Moses, when God communicated through Moses, and then through Moses' um, um, well, Joshua that came after him, and then eventually uh, giving them the law, and then eventually through the prophets. But Like I said, the uh, first half of the chapter was focused primarily on them, and really, you have just a little bit here in chapter set in chapter eleven, verse seventeen, for the next few verses about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Joseph, and then it goes over to Moses. So, starting in verse seventeen, it says, "By faith Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises was in the act of offering up." his only son, of whom it was said, Through Isaac shall your offspring be named. He considered that God was able to even to raise him up from the dead, from which, figuratively speaking, he did receive him back. By faith, Isaac invoked future blessings on Jacob and Esau. By faith, Jacob, when, he, when dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph, bowing worship over the head of his staff. By faith, Joseph, at the end of his life, made mention of the exodus of the Israelites and gave directions concerning his bones. You have a short section here about the patriarchs. The first one, of course, is Abraham. and talks about Abraham's test. And we know about how Abraham was tested in, in Genesis chapters 22 and 23, that God told, told Abraham to go to go to Mount, uh, the mountains of Moriah and to go to the top of the mountain and that he was offered to offer Isaac as a sacrifice and we know that he took a couple servants he took Isaac and then he left the two servants and then he went on up to the top of the mountain with Isaac we know that he built, a, he, he built an altar and he laid down uh, some wood on that altar that, that Isaac had carried up the mountain um, we know that that Isaac was, that, that Abraham was 100 years old when Isaac was born. And Isaac's old enough to carry the wood up the mountain. And he even asked, you know, I've got the wood and you've got the fire. Where's the sacrifice? And, and Abraham makes that very powerful statement to his son, says, God will provide. They go up to the mountain, he makes the altar, lays the wood. And then he asks to tie up Isaac. And he ties his hands and his feet. Isaac is probably, if not a teenager, he's pretty close to it. I mean, he's not a tiny little kid or he wouldn't be able to carry all the wood for the sacrifice. He's able to carry a pretty decent-sized bundle of wood. And to be smart enough to know to ask a question, like, where's the sacrifice? And so chances are good he could have run away from his dad. He could have put up a fight. But Isaac submitted to his dad, was tied up, laid on the altar, we 
know that in the text that Abraham raised the knife and the angel stopped him and said there was a ram caught in the brush and he untied his son sacrificed the ram that was there and he, this is the mentioning of what he had done you know Abraham believed God's promise that that the nation, that all the nations of the world would be blessed through Isaac, despite the fact that he thought he was going to kill Isaac. And so Abraham knew that, that God could raise him from the dead or do any number of things to stop him. Abraham did everything but slit his throat. He was ready to do it. received him back just kind of like he was back from the dead uh, and of course think about the imagery that's here you know um, Isaac wasn't uh, sacrificed but what was put in his place well you know a, a, a sheep was put in his place um, you know we very much are in a similar situation in theological we, we deserve to be on the altar and, and punished for our sins, but yet Christ, the Lamb of God, is put there in our place and sacrificed for us. And so certainly there's some imagery that is there. Um, you know, what a great thing that is that, that, he, that he does that. Any questions or comments on, on that through verse 19? Um, one of the most powerful, I think, images ever in Scripture. And of course, the, the idea that you know, God told um, Isaac that God will provide, you know, what, that's one of the greatest messages about what God does and how God acts. And, and you know, Abraham even named the place God provides. Yeah, and you know that, that's that's very true. That the you know the, they tried to change God's plan by by uh, having uh, Abraham marry Sarah's handmaid Hagar and have a child by by her, and you know that that caused a lot of strife strife and difficulty for them. Even though polygamy was an allowed thing at times in the Old Testament, it was a practically necessary. In almost every society in all of human history, there's been more women than men. Men get themselves killed. They get gored by oxen. They die in war. They whatever. There's almost always more women. In an ancient world, how is a woman going to be protected? She either need she had to be under a man's protection, or else she was in an extremely vulnerable situation. So if it wasn't her father's house, it probably had to be somebody else's house. And God allowed that. Oh, yeah, it, wasn't, it was never what God designed. It was never what God wanted. But it was something that was allowed for that time, for that part in history. And I'll tell you, the, the, the instances that it takes place, the biggest problems they have in their life are the, are the result of the relationships involving the multiplicity of marriages. It was the problem between Jacob's kids, you know, the ones that were Leah's and the, the couple that were... Rachel's and the, with the handmaid's kids, they didn't get along well, and that's why they, that's why they threw one of them in a pit and told their father that he'd, he'd died. You know, Joseph. Um, you know, the problem with Abraham was the problem between uh, Hagar and, and Sarah. And, you know, then then you had, you know, all those instances. You know, 
Solomon's, Solomon was noted for his wisdom, but it was his, his multiple wives, but, but he, he turned all of Israel's heart away from God. You see, the big problem with Solomon was is he married all those, those women from foreign nations. You know, when the text says he had 700 wives, he probably had more. Because it says he had 700 wives that were foreign born, that were from another nation. Those 700 wives were all alliances, trade alliances with other nations. He probably married a few of them that weren't outside of the country. He probably married a few of the Jewish women. And so it was probably more than that, the minimum of 700. And so what he allowed them to do was they brought their foreign god. And so he brought idolatry into Israel brought on all those foreign women with their their idols. So he he allowed each of them to do their their own religion and it turned his heart away from God and eventually the people. It was exactly why God wanted all those people run out of the land. And even the ones he did run out, well, Solomon brought them in. Well anyway, it was that was a mess and certainly um, not the way that God ever Look in, if you look in the beginning of Genesis, it's one man and one woman for life is what God intended. That's what it's always been, you know, the way that, the way that uh, he always wanted to be. And any time you go outside of that, you know, you, you're, you're getting in a mess. And, uh, and, and not, and, and most of the things outside of that are even sinful. Okay. Um, Also, Isaac, he blessed his sons, uh, Jacob and Esau. And, of course, we know about all that with uh, Jacob tricking his father and, and his father's poor eyesight and tricking him by putting on the, uh, the goat skins by way of his mother and just all of that. But, but, but Isaac gave blessings to his son. The most important thing about that was is that it had been prophesied that the younger would, would rule over the but it was also pro- important because that's the lineage that God's people would come through, and so uh, that needed to be uh, just to stay the way that it was. And so he played his part in that. Um, Jacob, on his deathbed, blessed the sons of, of uh, Joseph, Ephraim, and Manasseh, the two sons born to Joseph before they. Uh, before the whole family came down to Egypt, those two sons were blessed in such a way that they became half tribe. The eleven other sons of, of uh, Jacob received the tribe uh, tribal allotment. There is no tribe of Joseph. The reason why there's no tribe of Joseph, you know, is from where he he uh, you know he he thought he was gone. Jacob did, and so he, as far as the inheritance goes took on Ephraim and Manasseh, and they each got a half tribe. And so there's 11 tribes plus the two half tribes. And so they were 12. And so, although that's 13 technically, um, that's that's the way that the tribal allotments were. That's why there's no tribe of Joseph. And then verse 22, by faith Joseph at the end of his life made mention of the exodus of the Israelites gave directions concerning his bones. You know, I had I had read that and read that over the years and thought Joseph did a lot of amazing things, okay? Jo- Joseph Joseph takes up roughly 13 chapters in this book. His, his life is cha- Genesis 37 through 50. And I would put Joseph's life in some pretty elite company. Um, I can't think of very many people that I would say were more powerful in their determination and their commitment to God and their faithfulness to God and exhibited faith more than Joseph. I mean, he's the one that had the dreams. He's the one that was 
sold into slavery by his brothers. He's the one that did right by Potiphar, even though Potiphar's wife, you know, lied about him, tried to seduce him, lied about him. Then he was thrown into prison. But all, and then he kept continuing to, to interpret the dreams. And all through that, he kept his integrity. I mean, Joseph stands taller in his actions and his behavior than just almost anybody else in Scripture. I mean, obviously Christ, but, but there's very few people that Joseph just, I mean, Joseph, nothing, there's not one negative thing written about Joseph. Very few individuals that say that about him in Scripture. And with all the amazing things he did, like saving Egypt and therefore saving his family, and, and building up the nation and doing all of that, that's not what gets mentioned in Hebrews 11. What gets mentioned is he told him what to do with his bones. That's exactly right. And that, that's, that's, that's where I was wanting to go with that. You know, Joseph did a lot of, a lot of things. You could put the whole, you could fill the chapter with what Joseph did. But Joseph on his deathbed said, here's what I want you to do. I want you to take my bones and I want you to put them with my father and my grandfather. It was a foreign land in Egypt. But here's the thing. What do they do when they, they when, when the Israelites leave Egypt in, in Exodus? They they plunder the Egyptians. They take their silver and their gold. And, you know, because they've had all the ten plagues, and the Egyptians are glad to let them go. And it says that, you know, that Moses and the others remembered about what Joseph said, and they took Joseph's bones. From the time Joseph died to the time Moses is born is a little over 400 years. It's over. And then Moses is 80 years old when the Israelites come out. So roughly almost 500 years, it was in the minds and the hearts of the nation of Israel to say, you know what, someday we're taking Joseph out of here. There's some unfinished business. And our father Joseph said, one day you're going to carry me out of here. And so with his final breath, he is able to give them a beacon of something to look forward to. That one day we're coming out here and you're to take my bones. What an amazing legacy that was. When you look at it and think, oh, that's just so simple. I, I don't want to be buried here. Well, it's more complicated than that in the sense that they made the effort told them one day you're going to do that and you know how do you how do you help people have faith and strength 500 years after you're dead and gone you give them something to do some unfinished business that's what Joseph did you talk about a powerful thing you know that, that he did that think about that. Like I said, of all the things that Joseph did, that's the one that ends up being mentioned about giving direction to his bone, about his bones. But that was going to be a continual bit of unfinished business that their father Joseph said, one day we're coming out of here. And they knew it. And when they got ready to leave, it's time to take Joseph. Time to take Joseph home. We don't think of Joseph being a prophet, but that was prophetic that he did that. And uh, anyway, just powerful stuff that, that's there. And uh, like I say, you could fill the whole chapter with things of faith that Joseph did. And uh, having the faith to keep his integrity in Potiphar's house and in prison, and then when he became prime minister. Or leading over the nation. He kept his integrity, especially when his brothers came down there. You know, um, sometimes the, uh, 
sometimes the most the most difficult thing is to have a little fire and to keep your integrity with a little bit of fire. And he had a whole lot of fire. And you know, other other than the throne itself, Potiphar, I mean, excuse me, Pharaoh put him in charge of everything. You know, unless he tried to take over the throne, a coup, he could do whatever he wanted. That's pretty close to absolute power. You know? That's pretty close to it. You know? So, anyway, any questions or comments? certainly true and you know you think about people thinking about Joseph 500 years later but here we are um, 4,500 years later talking about Joseph you know thinking about drawing faith and strength from his from his life and and legacy Um, Joseph and and some of these individuals they, they lived a life descendants that came after them could live up to. Um, you know, good question to ask. Are you giving your family a, a name to live up to or to live down? Um, you know, just something to think about. Verse um, 23 says, By faith Moses, when he was born, was hidden for three months by his parents because they saw that the child was beautiful. They were, they were not afraid of the king's edict. Of course, the king's edict was to throw all the baby boys into the Nile River. Well, they kind of did that, didn't they? Um, they just put a boat around it, a little basket boat around it. We had on the sign the other day, I don't know if you saw it, uh, that, um, um, I forget what the exact wording was, um, Yeah, Moses started out as a basket case. You know, uh, I can't remember what the first part of it was, but the end of it was Moses started out as a basket case. You know, yeah. But yeah, they they kind of threw him in the river, and I, I just love that little story there. You know that that um, Pharaoh's daughter comes by with her maidens, and they find the baby in the, in the, the uh, bulrushes, and, and Miriam. Moses' older sister, she's about nine. Um, when you look at the ages, she's about nine years older. So she immediately comes up, and man, she was smart. She's a smart little girl. She she looks at, at uh, Pharaoh's daughter and says, "Hey, would you would you like one of the Hebrew women to, to nurse and take care of this baby, and 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 to hire that out?" And and Pharaoh's daughter says, "Well, of course. That sounds great." And so, Jochebed got paid to raise Moses, to nurse and raise Moses. Now, moms, if you can figure a way to do that, get paid to raise your kid, you know. But uh, Miriam was a, a smart, uh, smart cookie. Uh, she was. What's that? Yeah, it's definitely God's providence that uh, she was smart enough to be right there on the spot and say, "Hey, you want me to, to find one of the Hebrew women to take care of?" Choose their own mother. Choose Moses' own mother to do that. And so anyway, um, verse 24. By faith Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He considered the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt. For he was looking to a didn't want to hold on to the riches of Egypt, but instead he was rather to look for something else. Isn't it curious and all that? Yeah. 
yeah, he has taught those promises. Uh, so not only did she get paid to nurse him and raise him, she taught him. She stayed in his life, apparently, you know, beyond nursing him, but stayed in his life to teach him about who he really was and about the nation he came from and all those things so that when he got old enough to make his own choices, he chose to follow after his his lineage instead of being who he was adopted by and, and that being Pharaoh's daughter. He was he became a prince of Egypt, but he did not uh, he did not hold on to that. Anything else there? Oh absolutely. Who had the greater influence on Moses? His real mo- his real mother that was the hired hand, um, you know, had the great influence on him. Um, Pharaoh's daughter had an influence, but probably not anywhere near the impact that the other influence was. Anything else in there? say, well, you know, I'll leave it to the inside. Let me be a chameleon, blend in, and I'll influence when I can. And yeah. Oh, yes, those, those young years definitely are. They definitely are. Yeah, you caught where I was wanting, as I was wanting really, I was going to push it or another not. Uh, just remember he got it. But yeah, Christ is mentioned. Well, let's look at that. Verse 26. He considered the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt. How did he know anything about Christ? Well, yeah, that all the nations of the world will be blessed one day through the descendants. Um, Well, you see, that'd be another good question. See, you know, that'd be a good one for the box. You know, who, why, why is Moses searching for Christ at that point in time? Now, I've got enough questions for the fifth Sunday. So, but no, this that's kind of one that would be good. But um, here's the thing: what's been said earlier in the text, and what's going to be said later, is that. That Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, all these people are searching for a country. A country made by God. A, co- a spiritual country. Maybe not necessarily here on land, but a, a country. And Moses may have not known all the particulars about that, but he knew following after God and the God that his mother talked about to him was what he wanted over and above anything and everything that Egypt had to offer. Because Egypt had an idolater system you know, which they they, um, they worshipped the, the, the sun and other things and, and you know they um, they had a system that ended up being a lot like what would later come on many many years later with the Greeks and the Romans but they they, they were deep into the astrology, and, and that's why the, the pyramids are the way they are. And they're really fascinating, by the way. You know how those are built. And the, that that the pyramids are in the shape of Orion, and all bunch of stuff. Fascinating, fascinating stuff. But they were very much um, astronomers and astrologers, and uh, just deep into that. Um, fascinating, but not the way to pattern your life. Not the religion that you should follow. Well, he rather instead was going to follow after that country that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and all the others were after. Knew.
knew about a promised Messiah, knew about one to come, and he wanted that far greater than anything that he had to offer. Yes, Tom. Certainly. Right, right. And, you know, Moses is, um, yeah, Moses is, strengths and his character and, and action and what was going to come about later on in his life yeah there was there was something in him that that caused him to uh, to see far beyond what was just there and, and certainly that was the case but yes it is very intriguing that, that Christ is mentioned specifically but but it comes down to the fact that he's looking for that that kingdom that God has brought that is going to have a king which we know is Christ as the king over that kingdom and he was looking forward working toward or pointing toward that kingdom more than the, the kingdom he could tangibly see in, in Egypt yes Tom Yeah, and I, I think that's very true that there was a, yeah. There are some people's lives in, in the Bible that are just kind of, I mean, they have to make their own choices, but there are just a few people in the Bible that their life's just kind of magnified, and, you know, greater, you know, like Moses and Paul and some others. Uh, I mean, they have their own choice. They're still fallible human beings. They sin, make mistakes like all of us. Their lives are just exceptional because of the things they were able to do and be a part of. Yeah, 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 exactly. He got to do all that. He, he was able to, to, to witness and, and have a communication with God that really, on an ongoing basis there for a while, that nobody else has ever been able Okay. Um, verse um, 27 is where we left off. By faith he left Egypt, not being afraid of the anger of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. You know, there again, kind of a comment toward God and toward Christ, seeing the one that's by faith he kept the Passover, sprinkled the blood so that the destroyer of the firstborn might not touch them. You know, and of course, it goes on um, in verse 29 to say, By faith the people crossed the Red Sea, it was on dry land, but the Egyptians, when they attempted to do the same, were drowned. By faith the walls of Jericho fell down after they encircled seven times. By faith, Rahab the prostitute did not perish with those who were disobedient because she had given a friendly welcome to the spies. All of this through Moses' time or right after that. Rahab came right after Moses did and Jericho did as well. Um, Joshua led the people into the, the promised land. and Jericho was the first town they came to. But all through this, faith was the driving force the same as all the things before and everything afterwards by faith actions were done you know always there is an obedience in connection with and a work connected with the faith you know none of the people it says by faith they sat on their hands and trusted to God no it's by faith they did such and such. You know, by faith Moses, his parents hid him. By faith Moses chose to not be known as an Egyptian, but, but be known to, um, to suffer for Christ. By faith he wasn't afraid of the king and he went off. By faith the walls of Jericho fell. You know, by faith Rahab because of what they did, you know, and, it's, and, and we 
we know about how that in, in the book of James, chapters 2 and 3 of James, it talks about faith and works and how those are balanced. Well, Hebrews 11 does a really good job of, of showing us how that balance is. Faith is the driving force that causes people to do. You know, it's the, it's the definition we saw in the first verse. You know, the evidence of things... The assurance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, you know, the, the, that we have. And so that motivates us to do. Because if we have that belief, that understanding that God's going to help, then we do it. And, and both of those things need to be in place, our faith and works. And how do we know that Abraham, Moses, those people had faith? Because of what they did same way with James. Faith and works. I'll share about my, my faith by what I do. And, and that illustrates that very well. There. Okay. Any other questions or comments? we got about a minute left. Okay. We will finish up chapter 11. Go ahead. We'll finish up chapter 11 next week. And then um, we'll, we'll, we'll finish up. We'll probably do two weeks in chapter 12 and one in 13 because we want to finish uh, the book of Hebrews by the end of February, because we've got four more Wednesdays, because uh, we haven't announced it yet, but I'll, I'll just kind of let you know. We're going to be doing a study starting in March with the congregation and, and, uh, and doing, so uh, it'll be a special study and kind of do something. It, it's not going to be exactly like the big picture study, but it'll be something where we do together with the middle school and high school and adults. I think it'll be good. I think it'll be good and challenging for all of us. And we'll be telling you more about that in the next few weeks. But just to let you know, we got to get done with, with uh, Hebrews in the next four weeks. So, so pray we don't get snow and we get have to cancel Wednesday.